everybody to this uh, Harbin Investor Forum. Um, my name is Keith Hiscock and I'm the Chief Executive of Harbin & Co. These forums give uh, investors the chance to hear a company's or a fund's investment case and question the management, DWF Group. Uh, the legal services space is a very interesting one for investors because the UK is a, a global leader in it, but it's quite difficult to invest in uh, because most of the uh, legal practices are partnerships and uh, anybody outside the partnership doesn't get the chance to, um, uh, uh, to share in those kind of returns. Um, we ha we've had a number of uh, law firms listed in the, couple of year in the last few years, however, uh, amongst which is DWF. What's different about DWF is that it's um, a global firm. Uh, it's got uh, uh, 4,000 staff in, uh, in something like 30 locations across the world. There are three parts of its business, the, the bit you will all think of, which is legal advisory, but then they've got a business called Mindcrest, which provides outsourced and standardised alternative legal workflows and connected services, which is business services complementing uh, the legal offering. You'll see up on your screen a little slide shows you who the shareholders are. Pretty, pretty uh, good set of uh, names there. Uh, decent uh, dividend yield on this. Um, but I think the chart below uh, is interesting because it's got four lawyers on there. They all, um, the share prices of all of them took a bit of a bath uh, when the pandemic hit uh, and, they've, um, and they've recovered uh, pretty well from that. The one that's still below that level of the level of January is DWF, which you might well argue provides the, uh, the biggest opportunity um, for investors. Uh, today, we're, we're very lucky to have the uh, group CFO of DWF, uh, Chris Stefani, uh, to, uh, to address us. Chris, over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Keith, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Great to be talking to you. I am Chris Stefani. I'm the Chief Financial Officer of uh, DWF Group. Um, very brief background about me. I spent 17 years at EY. Uh, always an accountant for the accountant. So I was back office finance and then I've spent the last almost six years at DWF. Uh, so I've got about 23 years uh, in the professional services sector, focusing on performance improvement and business optimization. Uh, fun fact, I started life as a law graduate, but I thought it was too dull. So became an accountant instead. So you can take from that what you will about me, but uh, I've ended up at DWF, uh, which when I joined was a privately owned law firm, but uh, Two and a half years ago, in February February nineteen, listed on the main market of the London Stock Exchange. This is a bit of a summary of who we are, albeit Keith has touched upon uh, some of these points. So, we are a full service law firm, but we call ourselves a, a legal business, and that's quite deliberate. And it might sound like lawyerly semantics, but the fact that we're not just a law firm, we also have. Uh, Mindcrest, which is an alternative legal services provider, uh, and we have connected services, which provides adjacent services uh, to law that we know that our, many of our clients need. Uh, our strategy is centred around integrating those services uh, and selling integrated, what we call integrated legal management to our clients. Uh, we're the only main market listed uh, legal business. Uh, we felt the main market was appropriate for our scale. Um, and um, there's a small cohort of other listed legals, six in total on AIM. Uh, we hope and expect there to be more coming to market, and we would welcome that, uh, because currently uh, we are a, an asset class that I think is not uh, not fully understood. The statistics you see on this uh, page, I, I won't read them back to you, but um, you can see the geographical reach. Uh, we've got 30 global locations. We operate in eight sectors, and uh, our scale uh, to uh, April 21 was 338 million. In terms of the market that we operate in, um, the characteristics are outlined here. There's a lot of words on here, but I'll give you just the six sound bites. And that is, we are in a growing market, 750 billion globally, growing at a rate of circa 5%. Um, the other things that are going on in the market, ALSP is accelerating. So that part of the market, those are alternative legal service providers bringing technology and process into the mix, challenging really the traditional model, growing at 15% per year. Now, we bought Minecrest, which is an ALSP. We're one of the very few uh, firms that we're aware of that have that sort of offering. Uh, clients are rationalizing the supply chain. So their the work is being shared out amongst fewer firms. Uh, so those with a global reach serving global clients will tend to uh, fare well in that environment. There's huge fragmenta fragmentation still, though, and I think the supply chain consolidation is going to drive 
uh, consolidation, uh, and we welcome that. We believe M&A is going to be an important part of our strategy, and it has been in the past. Um, ESG is rising up the agenda, so increasingly you have to have credentials uh, in that space and show that you're operating uh, for more than just profit. And then, you know, the listing point is an important one. There are seven firms currently listed, of which we are one. Uh, we believe that places is very well to be able to execute M&A and to take advantage of the growth opportunities in the market. Um, and we think there'll be others coming to the market. But uh, to some extent, we invested early in the asset that is being listed and uh, we uh, intend to leverage that. Brief history. Keith showed the share price graph. And if you were to all overlay that on this, uh, you would you would sort of see the turbulence that we've had. Um, we started out when we when we um, acquired Minecrest back in February 20, just prior to COVID. We were at about just over £1.40 share price. COVID impacted. We had to do two market updates as a result because it impacted in the final quarter of our, quarter of our year just when we had uh, deployed some debt on, off the balance sheet for two acquisitions, one of which was Minecrest. Uh, the end result of all that turbulence was uh, a, a change in CEO. Uh, and the appointment of a CEO uh, and a 100-day plan to really get the business back on track and focused. And um, over the course of the year, you can see a lot happen. But the highlights were, well, firstly, the appointment of Sir Nigel Knowles as our CEO. He uh, built one of the largest law firms in the world, DLA. Uh, so his, uh, his pedigree in the legal space is, is really uh, a force to be reckoned with. Uh, we took actions around uh, loss-making and misaligned operations. Uh, and, and took a lot of uh, negative EBITDA drag out of the mix. We invested further in uh, capacity in Minecrest in Pune, which gives us a margin uh, labour arbitrage uh, opportunity. And we also affected a new operating structure, which really supports the strategy uh, that we're executing. And th that strategy is very simple. Uh, we've got three offerings, the legal advisory or traditional law, Minecrest, which is the LSP, connected services which are adjacent but needed by our clients. And that really encourages the, uh, the supply chain consolidation angle. Um, we, uh, the, the divisions here are laid out in, in numbers. And you can see legal advisory is the largest with the highest margin, what you would expect really in sort of traditional legal services. Over time, we expect the uh, Mindcrest and Connected to grow at a faster pace and also for the margins to expand in both of those businesses as they mature from investment phase. Um, but the whole point is we want to broaden the share of wallet with our clients and, and the, the trends that I talked about in the sector are for that supply chain consolidation. So we feel we are well placed. Um, this is just an example of integrated legal management in action. So we've got our claims management uh, offering in connected services, uh, referring uh, 5.9 million of work in FY21 into legal advisory. Uh, we expect that to rise to 8 million uh, in FY22, the year we're, we're currently trading in. Now, that will make Connected Services the third largest client for our insurance practice area, uh, which just goes to, to show that kind of client sharing uh, opportunity that our strategy is looking to leverage. Um, and then no presentation about our business would be complete without talking about being a responsible business. Uh, again, I won't read all the characteristics here, but um, you know, we are committing to uh, science-based targets and we're going to release our uh, ESG strategy along with our results on the 9th of December. Uh, we've got the DWF Foundation through which we donate to uh, charities and good causes. Uh, and we have um, what we believe are, are, are quite bold targets around uh, diversity, uh, particularly in you know, senior leadership and uh, in workforce representation. Then on to the financials. So these are the financials to April 21. So slightly out of date in that we're about to issue our half year results to October, which we'll release on the 9th of December. But you can see here net revenue uh, to April 21 grew by 14%. Uh, that included an M&A impact, but also 8% uh, organic growth. We expanded revenue per partner, which is a productivity metric, which is a bellwether for gross margin, which you can see is a third point on that slide. And that we expanded margin by almost three percentage points. We then took 2.2 percentage points out of our uh, cost to income ratio, which is just overheads as a percentage of revenue. And that all drove the uh, adjusted PBT to more than double. Now, that was from a low base point, which was heavily COVID affected. Um, and we're very pleased with 125% improvement, as you can imagine. But that's still only a 10% margin on revenue. If you look at the other listed legals, they range between 12 and 18 
Uh, and we believe there's no structural reason why we shouldn't be trading in a similar range eventually. Uh, and our guidance points towards that. Uh, EPS uh, followed PBT in terms of trend. And attached to that was a, a four and a half P full year uh, dividend per share. Dividend's important to us because the partners are uh, significant shareholders. Uh, and that is essentially part of uh, their income. The final two dynamics here are around the balance sheet. So lockup is a, a, a metric, I think, unique to professional services and especially law. It's a measure of working capital efficiency. Um, taking 20 days out of the cycle is a good thing that is worth just over a million in cash per day. Uh, now, we didn't see a consequent reduction in net debt. We reduced it by 5 million. That's because we um, are paying down deferred consideration for the acquisitions I mentioned earlier. So we currently have a higher level of leverage um, than we would normally trade on. I'll, I'll talk about where we end up on that very shortly. Very quickly then, the, 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 the two-year trend uh, is illustrated in the graphs that follow. The bar charts are absolute numbers in half-year increments, and the red line uh, red lines are percentage um, on the right-hand axis. And you can see revenue growth has consistently been in the close to double-digit range, strong organic, supplemented by M&A, and the growth continued in FY21 despite us discontinuing and slimming down a number of loss-making operations. You can see the COVID impact here. So gross margin over the same time period dipped in FY20 H2 and then bounced back and then improved as we executed some uh, operational changes to drive efficiency and then cost to income ratio, a steady downward drift. All of that driving an even more um, uh, uh, impact, a greater impact on PBT because of the operating leverage in the business, which dipped considerably in uh, FY20 H2. But then you can see the bounce back and you can see the trajectory getting into 12% range in the second half of FY21. So that plays to the sort of trajectory I mentioned earlier, and EPS and DPS following suit. Lockup days, which is working capital efficiency and cash generation stretched by COVID to 206, and then 10 days out of the cycle in each of the two following half years, and then you can see free cash flow, negative in FY20 H1, uh, slightly positive in H2, and then significant cash generation as we got some efficiency and discipline into the business uh, following uh, the appointment of Sir Nigel and Matt Doughty as COO. And you can see net debt relatively flat, but leverage, if we were to show that on a graph, on a steady downward drift. Talking of capital management, so dividends important to us target payout ratio of up to 70% of adjusted profit after tax, interim in February, March time, final October. Um, borrowings and leverage target to be between half a turn and one times pre IFRS 16 EBITDA. M&A, very much back onto the agenda now that we are trading uh, strongly, um, albeit we would be circumspect about how much cash we commit off the balance sheet. Uh, we intend to use our list status to make sure we can uh, affect strategic M&A and CapEx, relatively capital light business, where we invest is around IT, as you might expect, particularly infrastructure and cybersecurity. And we'll also invest in buildings because what we have proven over the last uh, 18 months is that we do not need the level of space we currently have. Um, we've all proved that. We spend 25 million on properties. Our staff tell us they want to come in maximum of 50% of the time. Now, we won't lose 50% of that cost, but we're certainly attacking it uh, with the intention of bringing some efficiency into the mix. We reinstated guidance uh, when we uh, came out with our full year results in July. Um, we are predicting medium term uh, revenue growth KGAR between 6 and 7%, margins expanding to between 53 and 54 at the gross margin level, and cost to income ratio of 38%. That all plays through to uh, a pre-BT margin that gets into the teens and then lock-up days, we intend to drive down further uh, and that's going to have a knock-on on, on leverage. Base case guidance only. If M&A happens, it will be incremental to this. So broadly, what we've achieved in FY21 and what you know, we, we, will, we will talk more about uh, when we come out in December is that we've been growing strongly. Uh, we've been doing that, by, but, uh, but also it's profitable growth. We've been driving margin efficiency, and that's dropped through to the PBT. And at the same time, uh, we're driving balance sheet health and aiming to reduce net debt and leverage over time. Uh, and uh, EPS has increased uh, significantly, uh, and we uh, we paid the largest dividend we've ever paid at 4.5p. Bear in mind, 
we're two and a half years listed, so we don't have a long history, albeit we've been in existence for more than 40 years, not as a listed entity. So why invest? Well, we think we've got a differentiated model. We're a global business. The revenue attributes include some predictable recurring alongside transactional. Uh, we've got an opportunity in the market to do uh, opportunistic M&A. Um, we're experts in what we do. Uh, we're a diverse team, and we've got very experienced management, both in professional services and in the legal sector, um, to drive you know, continued progress within the business. And, and we aim to be the leading global provider of integrated legal and business services in a market that um, is growing and, and has uh, huge opportunities. That's everything I wanted to say, and I'm, I'm really happy to take questions now. You see, you've transitioned from basically being a private, very ambitious, traditional law firm into a listed business with very significant international aspirations. Has there been a significant change in the internal culture of the business in order to be able to meet this? And we could, you could maybe address this from two issues. One is, have you lost certain key people, but also has it meant that in terms of hiring teams of people, they've found coming to DWF more attractive than they possibly would have done in the past? Um, okay, great. R really interesting question. So DWF has for quite a long time really been quite corporate in its approach. So I uh, you know, had a CEO rather than a managing partner for, for or CEO and managing partner for many years. Uh, remuneration committees, uh, very few issues that were voted on by the partnership. So DWF had come a long way down the kind of corporatized model before uh, listing. So it wasn't so, so much of a shock to the system, and we had a decent run-in of, of, uh, of a time period to educate the partnership in what it means to be not privately owned anymore and to be reporting to the market. Um, and I think we've, we've turbocharged that over the last uh, 18 months in particular, uh, given the, you know, the very real impact of COVID and how, how much focus that put on governance and so on in a listed model. Uh, so we've come a long way, um, uh, but these things are evolution, not revolution. And I think with, frankly, every month that passes, we are more corporate and PLC in our approach than we've ever been. Um, from a point of view of hiring, we lost very, we've lost very few people uh, from the point of view of uh, senior partners and so on. I think the people that didn't want to be part of a listed business you know, got off the bus before the listing happened. Uh, we've got very low regretted attrition. And yeah, we are attracting people who believe in two things. One, the differentiated model and the fact that we're doing something different to being just a law firm. And two, the fact that we're listed. Uh, and that um, has a number of different things. It gives us opportunities uh, to invest and in access to capital that others don't have. Uh, it also allows us to reward in a more innovative way. And most important of all, I mean, if, if from the reward perspective, you put partners' capital into a, a, a private firm, uh, and when you leave, you you take your capital out and you get the same amount. Um, we have the opportunity for capital upside as well as income uh, in the remuneration model that we offer. Okay, I've got a very specific question here from Martin, and then I want to go back and and just talk about um, acquisitions and the value of the DWF brand. Um, so Martin says there are similar legal companies listed on the AIM market, which is what Keith said at the beginning. Um, and these trade at a higher multiple to DWF. This may be due to inheritance tax advantages of the AIM market. So this, we're talking about business relief and the IHT funds that are able to, to buy in this market and obviously for private investors as well. So would DWF consider a move to the AIM market to boost the share price? Another way of saying this is um, what are the benefits of being on the main main market as opposed to on AIM for you? I think um, we, 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 we don't uh, or haven't had the view that um, not being on AIM and not having the IHT advantages has uh, constrained our share price. I think, frankly, in life, uh, timing is everything. Uh, and being we, we, we came into the market in Q1 of... of uh, 2019, which is one of the leanest periods for IPOs. Uh, so it was a difficult listing. Um, we then were just beginning to get momentum and Minecraft began and the acquisition there uh, got, got us to a peak share price of I think £1.44. And there was real momentum there. And then COVID hit and it was the perfect storm for us because it hit in the, the crucial final quarter of our year uh, when we had fairly punchy targets that we were you know, expecting to meet. Um, so a, a lot of the lost revenue dropped through in that final quarter, plus we were 
uh, more highly leveraged than we would normally have been expected to because cash collection is slow. And so all of those things led to two, uh, well, essentially profit warnings. And if you look at the share price graph, you'll see that it bottomed out at about 50p. So we listed at £1.22. We trading today, I think we opened at 108. Um, so we've clawed a lot of the lost ground back. I, I think there's a degree of uh, demonstrating a track record, which we're now doing. Uh, and I think that is the thing that will uh, drive share price appreciation. But you know, you're quite right. The multiple is low. Uh, it's not just us saying it. You can't, we don't really like commenting on our own share price because we just want to run the business and the share price ought to take care of itself. But if you look at the analyst research, you know, the target price is well above uh, where we're currently uh, currently trading, and they all comment on the fact that the multiple uh, looks um, you know anomalous. So I'm going to try to combine this uh, two questions into one. So when you're looking to buy other firms, are you looking to buy the brand name, the people? What is it you're trying to buy, and how do you value whatever that asset is? And the second question is. Why would firms want to sell to DWF as opposed to anyone else? What is it that you offer that other firms possibly don't offer? Okay, there's a few different dynamics in there. So um, we acquire where we want to either be in a new geography, um, a new specialism, or if we want to expand the capacity that we've got in areas that are, that are hot. We only acquire where we are very confident that there's cultural alignment because, you know, fundamentally we're a people business. Um, so you just can't acquire for acquisition's sake and it's got to be strategically aligned. Um, what we value is, um, well, one, you know, access to the, to either new market or new, new offering. Um, and we um, value the expertise that we are um, acquiring and the track record of profitable growth, frankly. Client overlap's important. Um, and you know, we structure deals in a number of different ways. We don't always pay a multiple. We have done uh, NAV deals. Uh, why do people come to us? Well, or want to be acquired by us? Partly, uh, I think, the, the growing strength of the brand. I think that plays to the main market point you asked about earlier. We're... we're We've probably got a degree of prominence from that. Um, I think the integrated legal management offering and the fact that people recognize that resonates with clients. And frankly, being listed, we have the ability to structure deals in a way that private law firms would not. Uh, and therefore, um, you probably see more traditional merger activity in the private space, whereas in the listed space, we can do things uh, in a little more of an innovative way. So the, the last question is basically due to something you, uh, is related to something you mentioned, which was the impact of COVID on the business model. So I think um, even before COVID, people were having issues in trying to um, value law firms because it simply is a relatively new sector to the market for the general investor. Then we've had COVID and COVID has obviously made a number of changes. Um, or we've referred to a number of changes. How easy will it be for you to, um, I would say, transmit the new working model for um, the, the post-COVID period, given the fact you've said there will be far less emphasis on space, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if, what should investors really be looking at as the two or three key metrics in order to measure your business against other businesses in the sector going forward? So it's to try to help investors understand what's happening, which is exactly what we're, we've got this session about today. Yeah. Um so I think demonstrating profitable growth is point number one for me. Um, growth for growth's sake is you know is not going to get anybody anywhere. It's got to be profitable growth. We we've, we've come from a sort of unique place from the point of view of where we were profitability wise when we listed, and then what happened post COVID. And um, so I think demonstrating profitable growth and frankly just uh, delivering on our guidance and uh, extending the track record of performance is going to be crucial. Um, we're coming from a space where we, you know, we, we deployed quite a lot of capital on two acquisitions, which we're very happy we made because they're performing very well. Um, as those kick off cash, we will, we will deleverage. And leverage is a sensitive point in this sector. Um, we are at the higher end uh, compared to the other uh, listed legals. And as we continue to demonstrate self-help through lockup reduction and uh, reduced leverage through cash generation and profit improvement, then that combined with a, a growing PPT margin is really what I would point people towards. Profitable growth, balance sheet health. Um, I, I would hope that will be recognised from the point of view of value. 
Chris, that's absolutely fantastic. It's been great chatting to you. So uh, that concludes the presentations today. I'd like to thank our speakers and you, the audience, for attending uh, this forum. Thank you very much.